Well, thank you, the Vice Chancellor, the, for that very generous uh, introduction. Uh, yeah, it's uh, my great pleasure to be here. I mean, believe it or not, I've been uh, as far as uh, Bingley, uh, where a very good friend of mine hails uh, from, and uh, I uh, was there to celebrate his wedding, but I haven't quite made it uh, to Bradford uh, so far, even though I have known people like uh, Dr. Anand and Dr. Weiss, and <coughs> before that, uh, uh, Dr. Colin Kirkpatrick and so on. So uh, it gives me great uh, pleasure to be here and I'm really waiting to sample the uh, curry uh, for which uh, the town is, I'm told, justly famous. Right, um, yeah, let's, uh, you know, I mean, uh, these big lectures uh, can become quite, I mean, uh, a somber affair. So. Uh, I want to make it a bit lighter uh, and, and start with uh, a picture. You know, <coughs> this man <laughs> once uh, famously said that the problem with the French people is that they don't have the word for entrepreneurship. <laughs> you know, don't laugh, uh, you know, he was a busy guy, you know, he had to invade Afghanistan, he had to worry about North Korea, you know, he had to choke on a pretzel. Hmm? <laughs> You know, he had a lot on his plate, so I don't blame him, you know, especially as uh, someone who doesn't speak French. I don't blame his uh, lack of uh, the knowledge of uh, French language, but he was actually articulating a fairly common Anglo-American prejudice against France as an uh, undynamic and laid-back country, you know, like this, uh, the full of meddling bureaucrats, pompous waiters, and sheep-burning farmers. Eh? Now, actually, this uh, conception of France uh, turns out to be completely wrong, as I'll show you with uh, objective numbers later. But the perspective behind this statement is actually quite widely accepted, namely the view that you need entrepreneurs to have a successful economy. Eh? I mean, who can argue with that? Now, in this view, the poverty of developing countries is therefore attributed to the lack of entrepreneurship very often. Yeah? So when the people from rich countries go to a developing country and see a scene like this, they say, aha, yeah, we know why this country is poor. You know? Look at all these men that are sitting in the cafe for, yeah, six, seven hours uh, drinking 11 cups of mint tea and you know, piping away at their hookah. You know, this is why they are poor. You know, they, they, they need these uh, the, you know, movers and shakers. They need entrepreneurs to go out and make things happen. Now, of course, that, that, uh, if you are from a developing country or if you have lived in a developing country for an extended uh, period of time, you know that this is actually quite an a typical scene because the typical scenes are more like this yeah? you know thousands and millions of people trying to sell the things well everything and even things that you never knew that could be sold yeah? yeah let me give you a few examples you know when i was <coughs> a young man that, that you know this is uh, before someone invented that uh, annoying uh, answering machine service. And if you wanted to get an interview in the, the, uh, for, for your visa in the US Embassy, you actually physically had to queue up. Yeah? So this uh, prompted that, that, that this uh, <coughs> entrepreneurial young Korean man to become well, what I can only call professional cures. Yeah? So what you do is uh, you wake up at 5 o'clock in the morning, you go and line up in front of the American Embassy. Yeah? Comes uh, quarter to nine, some guy in a sharp suit uh, turns up and says, oh, your spot looks very nice. Huh? Do you mind selling it to me? Yeah? If you woke up early and uh, you are in front of the queue, you might get uh, 50 bucks. 
if you're in the back, uh, maybe 15, but you know, you uh, made uh, your wage and you go home. Yeah? Even more amazing was that uh, when I first uh, went to South Africa, back in the early 90s, a friend of mine in Johannesburg uh, took me to a restaurant. And as that uh, he parked in front of the restaurant and we got out of the car, suddenly this guy turned up out of nowhere and told my friend, can I watch your car while you are eating there? And my friend said, yeah, do that. And Gave him money. So I said, hang on, what are you doing? I mean, that, that, watch your car? I mean, is that a job? I mean, that, and why are you paying him money? And my friend said, no, 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 what he means is that if you don't pay me, I'll slash your tires uh, while you are eating. Yeah? <laughs> you know, there are all these people in developing countries who have such ingenuity yeah, because they need to survive. Yeah? They are desperate to survive and uh, they come up with all kinds of ideas. Yeah? And when I thought, uh, gave uh, these examples uh, <coughs> in one of my lectures, I think it was in LSE. Uh, I mean, it was a different lecture, but I uh, talked about this a bit. And someone said, oh, no, actually, that I also that I have a very interesting job to report. Yeah? And this is uh, the basically the, the what <coughs> you have to call uh, the carpooler. Yeah? And this was invented in Jakarta. Yeah? What it is, is uh, the Indonesian government, uh, you know, Jakarta has uh, notorious traffic, yeah, introduced this uh, the fast lane where they let uh, cars with uh, more than two passengers go yeah, uh, without having to queue up uh, in the slow lane. Yeah. So this has uh, created this new joke called the, the carpooler, which means that this uh, young man loiter around at the beginning of the carpool lane and yeah, some guy in Toyota Land Cruiser pulls up and says, yeah, you and you get in. Yeah? Yeah, so he is now entitled to run on the carpool lane. He gets uh, wherever he has to very quickly. And he pays these guys, yeah, whatever, the five bucks, ten bucks. They go home. They are happy. He's happy. Yeah? You know, basically what I'm trying to tell you is that in developing countries, actually, you have to be very entrepreneurial even just to survive. Yeah? In contrast, in rich countries, most people have not e uh, even come near to becoming an entrepreneur. Yeah, yeah because uh, they mostly work for a company. Some of them employing tens of thousands of people, doing highly specialized and narrowly specified jobs and in the process, realizing someone else's entrepreneurial vision. And I still remember in the late 80s, right at the reading about the, I mean, it's still famous, but then very famous Toyota production system, and this book discussing why the American company has fallen behind Toyota. One of the reasons cited was over-specialization, and it cited this case of a General Motors engineer who spent his entire career of about 30 years designing door handles. Yeah? And he had actually no idea how even a door was made, not to speak of the car. Yeah? Anyway, so that, that, a lot of people do these uh, the very specialized things and in the process uh, realize someone else's vision. Uh, that they they yeah, haven't even thought of uh, having their own vision. Yeah? So if you actually look at the numbers, uh, it's uh, very clear, you know, I mean, of course, you know, people might dispute whether we could equate entrepreneurship uh, with uh, self-employment, but, you know, that, that's the most obvious uh, the kind of criterion I can think of. And if you use that, uh, that to see how entrepreneurial people are, you know, you see that on average, people in rich countries are far less uh, entrepreneurial than uh, those who live in poor countries. You know? And extreme cases, I mean, if you compare Norway, where the proportion of self-employed people is the lowest in the world, and compare it to, say, Bangladesh or Benin, you know, there are more than 10 times difference. You know? And on this uh, that, uh, count, uh, you actually that, uh, begin to realize that uh, <coughs> the U.S. 
uh, uh, the Americans are saying France is an undynamic country and so on is a, a classic case of a kettle calling the pot black, you know. They have two of the lowest uh, share of self-employment in the world, you know, the beaten only by Norway. And then, you know, George W. Bush thinks Americans are enterprising and the French are not, yeah? So you always have to look at numbers, huh? Oh, gosh, what's happening here? Ah, right, yeah. Yeah, so that <coughs> I tell you a bit uh, more about this uh, story in one of the chapters uh, in this book, but given all this, uh, the, it's uh, very natural to ask, okay, so if uh, people in developing countries are so much more entrepreneurial than their rich country counterparts, why are they poor? Yeah. I mean, we are always told that uh, we need entrepreneurs uh, to have a prosperous economy. We have 10 times more entrepreneurs in proportional terms in developing countries, and these countries are much poorer. Why? Yeah. Well, actually, the most popular answer to this, uh, at least in the last decade, decade and a half, has been that poor people in developing countries are entrepreneur, but uh, they cannot really realize their you know, that uh, vision because they lack access to credit. And this thinking has made this uh, uh, business of uh, microfinance very, very popular. Basically, lending very small sums, maybe even twenty dollars, but maybe. $100 or whatever to very poor people so that they could you know, actually get out of their poverty through entrepreneurial activities, you know? be it weaving baskets or raising chicken or whatever. You know? I mean, this uh, that became so popular that in 2006, uh, Dr. Muhammad Yunus the founder of the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh was even awarded a Nobel Peace Prize. Unfortunately, that especially since then, the industry has been put under very the, the stringent uh, investigation and it has transpired that uh, it has actually not done very much uh, to lift people out of poverty and it has done even less uh, in terms of generating sustainable long-term economic development. Now I'm not here to discuss uh, microfinance but uh, I'm uh, going to talk about it a bit because it's a very illustrative example. Of course uh, there are many reasons behind uh, this failure of uh, microfinance industry including the excessively high rates of interest rate charge. No? You know, actually there are many microfinance institutions that charge 100, even 200 percent of interest rate. No? And who can make that kind of profit? No? It's impossible to you know, get out of poverty using that kind of interest rate. No? Even the decent ones are usually charging 40, 50 percent. You know, I mean, uh, I haven't run any business, but uh, you know, the, the very few businesses, except in very short period of time, can generate that kind of profit. You know? So if you are borrowing money at 50% interest rate, it's that, uh, very difficult to you know, uh, get out of poverty using that money running your business. You know? There are other reasons, but uh, one key reason that uh, people don't often talk about is the basically lack of productive capabilities on the part of the individuals taking on these loans. Now, I mean, uh, this is not an obvious uh, statement, so I need to explain it a bit. You know, when a microfinance institution starts its operation in a locality, the first group of its uh, clients actually may see their income rising very substantially. So for example, uh, back in 1997, 
the Grameen Bank uh, teamed up with uh, Telenor, the Norwegian phone company, and gave out microloans uh, to women to buy a mobile phone and rent it out. Yeah? And this was a time when most uh, Bangladesh villages didn't even have uh, landline phones. Yeah? So this uh, phone business became very popular yeah? because that, uh, you know, you go to these people are called telephone ladies, yeah? go to one of these uh, telephone ladies, pay a small fee and make a phone call from uh, the, the, her phone to a relative in another village uh, who will be uh, served by another telephone lady. So the, initially this uh, business boom, and it is uh, said that uh, the telephone ladies at the beginning made typically between $750 and $1,200 per year in a country whose average per capita income at the time was uh, the $300. Yeah? So this is a remarkably good business. Eh? Well, unfortunately, exactly because of that, everyone wanted to do it. Yeah? And soon there were too many telephone ladies. Yeah? So by 2005, their average income fell to $70. And in the meantime, Bangladesh's uh, per capita income had risen to 450. So from making up to four times the national average income, this uh, business that uh, became so unprofitable that uh, people were making one-sixth of national income. Now, when you think about it, this problem would not have existed if uh, this uh, Telephone ladies could diversify into other businesses. Yeah? So if uh, renting a telephone becomes unprofitable, why not manufacture the mobile telephones or design softwares for mobile phone games? Yeah? And of course, uh, you are smiling because uh, the example is extremely absurd. But why? Because the poor ladies in Bangladesh uh, do not have the capabilities to diversify into other areas. Yeah? And this happens again and again and again in this microfinance business. You know? I mean, I have a friend who you know, the <coughs> works <coughs> in Southeast Asia, and once he jokingly said, you know, in the Cambodia, there's uh, so many you know, uh, microfinance uh, banks uh, that are lending money to everyone. If you go to Phnom Penh, the capital city, there are more people selling noodles on the street than people who can eat the noodles. Yeah, yeah the point is that uh, you give uh, money to kind of you know, semi-educated, middle-aged Cambodian ladies. How many things can they do? Yeah, yeah they can maybe sell fried rice instead of noodles, but you know, I mean, there's a very limited range of things that they can do. Yeah? Well, I won't uh, go the, more deeply into the, the, this uh, story because it's yeah. not the main, the, the, one of the main the stories uh, that I'm going to tell you about today. But this uh, short story about microfinance is actually very telling about the current state of, if you like, mainstream development discourse. Yeah? And by mainstream, I don't necessarily mean neoclassical or you know, neoliberal or you know, things like that. The prevailing development uh, discourse. And what I mean by this is uh, basically, you know, as suggested in the title of my speech, the disappearance of a serious thinking on production or more precisely on the development of productive capabilities. Hmm? Now, of course, uh, the definition of development has always been a contentious issue, and it will always remain so, but at least until the 1980s, there was actually one common element in many of the prevailing definitions of uh, development, which was that it involves the enhancement of productive capabilities. It was mainly about production. And when you think about it, this was actually what economics started as. You know, I mean, that some of you might have uh, read uh, at least bits of 
the wealth of nations uh, by Adam Smith, uh, the you know, not really, but uh, allegedly the first ever book written on economics. And what does it start the book with? Does it talk about money? Does it talk about international trade? Does it talk about banking? No, he talks about a humble factory, humble pin factory. So basically the story he tells out there is that you know, if one person tries to make a pin, he may make, uh, on his own, he may make maybe one pin, two pins a day, maximum 20 pins, yeah? Because he has to you know, draw the wire and cut the wire, sharpen the wire, attach the, the, the top and so on and so on. So he went to observe these uh, pin factories where this is uh, done through a division of labor. So he observed that if you divide the process into, say, 10 sub-processes and hire 10 people and make them do the same thing you know, all the time, you can actually produce you know, 4,800 pins instead of 20. You know? So he said that, that, that this is at the you know, heart of uh, economic development that was happening in Britain at the time. Yeah? Anyway, I mean, that, that's only the beginning, but uh, later, you know, the, in the sort of heydays of uh, development economics in the 1950s and 60s, you know, everyone uh, from Walt Rostow on the right uh, to the dependency theories on the left uh, share this view. You know, development is not exclusively, but primarily about transformation of the productive ca uh, capabilities and structure of a society, which then has you know, implications for lots of other things, you know, urbanization, you know, dissolution of uh, the traditional family, and what have you. Hmm? In contrast, uh, during the last uh, three decades, the dominant view has become that development is basically about poverty reduction. Yeah? As, uh, the, and this is uh, best uh, illustrated by the so-called MDGs, yeah? Millennium Development Goals of the United Nations. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, these are all kind of loadable goals, but there's very little in it about production. You know? It's all about making individuals healthier and better educated, you know, empowered and so on. And at most, uh, you say that, yes, uh, develop a global partnership, uh, which basically means that the rich countries will have to open their agriculture markets more so that poor countries can export more agriculture. Eh? But that's about it. And uh, even there, you know, I mean, it, it's kind of about production, but there's no notion that it should involve transforming your productive structure. Eh? You know, Ghana has been exporting cocoa. It should keep uh, that, uh, doing that kind of thinking. Yeah? So this is why I, in one of my papers, uh, the, say that uh, development has come to mean anything but development in the traditional sense and therefore has become Hamlet without the Prince of Denmark. Yeah? Well, that's the title of the paper, actually. I mean, you can download it from my website, uh, whose address I'll uh, show later. And behind this uh, transformation in development discourse has been three elements, I would say. The first is uh, neoliberalism. Eh? Now, neoliberalism is not the same as neoclassical economics, as uh, many people mistakenly believe. Yeah? You know, neoclassical economics provides uh, the, a lot of the theoretical tools for neoliberal thinking, but you know, unlike uh, the neoliberalism, you know, basically this idea that you need to get the state out of the economy and give uh, the, as much uh, the power to the market as possible through 
deregulation and privatization and so on. I mean, this idea is uh, not an inevitable conclusion of neoclassical economics. You know, I mean, the economists like Joe Stiglitz and Paul Krugman are neoclassical economists, but they do not issue that kind of uh, policy recommendation. Yeah? So it's a particular type of neoclassical economics, if you like. But even the, the people like Krugman, I mean, that, you know, neoclassical economics is basically about market exchange and oh, okay. has uh, little to say about production. And this is why Ronald Coase, uh, the British economist who taught in America for many decades and uh, won the Nobel Prize in Economics in 1992, in his uh, Nobel Prize uh, speech uh, der derogatively uh, described neoclassical economics as an economics about, and I'm quoting him, lone individuals exchanging nuts and berries on the edge of a forest. Yeah? There is no notion that, that, is, that there are these giant firms, you know, firms appear as a, a shadowy entity, if you like, I mean, uh, symbolizing, uh, symbolized by what is known as a production function. Yeah? There's uh, no notion that this has an organizational structure and managers and leadership and internal conflicts, I mean, that's missing. Yeah? Also, more importantly, in the neoclassical economics, uh, based on this, uh, uh, in, sorry, in neoliberal discourse, based on this uh, neoclassical economics, the issues surrounding the development of productive capabilities are basically assumed away because it takes our uh, capabilities as given and focuses on incentive. Yeah? If you look at the neoclassical trade theory, it basically takes uh, you know, the technologies as given and also importantly assume that all countries have the same capabilities to use any technology. So in that theory, if Guatemala is not producing things like BMWs, it is not because it cannot do that, but because it doesn't make economic sense given its relative capital and labor endowments. Yeah? Basically, the argument is that if you have a lot of labor, well, in relative terms, uh, and little capital, you need to specialize in products that use you know, labor-intensive technologies. Yeah? So you might uh, uh, still choose uh, not to produce BMW as uh, Guatemala, but in the theory, it is assumed that uh, anyone can use any technology if they want it, yeah? only that they shouldn't. Yeah? So the, this uh, issue of uh, technological capabilities, uh, product, productive capabilities, uh, these are automatically assumed away. Yeah? And of course, uh, you know, believing in the power of the free market, the neoliberal discourse criticizes criticizes any attempt to deliberately enhance productive capabilities through public policy intervention as being at, at best futile and at worst counterproductive. Yeah? So the, this uh, has been you know, one important thinking behind the neglect of uh, production, but uh, they were also influenced from, if you like, the other end of the uh, political spectrum people who I call the humanists. Yeah? Well, I mean, the, uh, the best known yeah, the kind of idea in this uh, tradition is uh, the Human Development Index uh, from the UNDP. Yeah, basically the, the thinking is uh, that we need to pay attention to individuals and their rights because that, uh, the early development discourse uh, was uh, too, if you like, collectivist. Yeah, yeah so that, uh, when you look at the uh, development economics of the 1950s and 60s, even including Amartya Sen himself, uh, who later became the guru of this uh, human thinking, they were all writing about this, that, that uh, structural changes in aggregate terms. So the uh, economic development was about increasing savings and investment and transferring uh, surplus labor from the countryside to the you know, 
uh, cities and so on. And in applying this theory, individuals were forgotten and worse, repressed in the name of the greater good called economic development. So this uh, prompted the humanists uh, to emphasize the need to enhance individual capabilities yeah, through health, education, empowerment. I mean, this is Amatya's and yeah, uh, Amatya Sen's uh, idea. Yeah. yeah, very important point. But once again, I mean, uh, this idea of production is not there and, you know, if you begin to focus on the, the things like health education, you know, you basically get the MDGs. Yeah? And the third uh, the influence was uh, what I call post-industrialism. Yeah, basically people have argued that, you know, rising income has brought about the shift of demand towards services. And therefore, manufacturings are not important anymore. Yeah? <coughs> so, you know, especially during the dot com boom of the late 1980s and early 2000s, you know, people basically denigrated that uh, making things. You know, I mean, we we are not consuming things anymore. That that well, I mean, proportional terms are to the uh, same extent and. You know, increasingly intangibles are becoming important and so on and so on. And they have uh, often cited cases like Switzerland and Singapore as examples of service-based uh, prosperity. And the implicit assumption was that you know, manufacturing is something that not everyone can do probably, but uh, services are things that most countries can do. You know, call centers, I mean, how difficult can it be, you know? So the, this is actually a new route to development and they have uh, cited the case of India, uh, which you know, is uh, supposed to have uh, become a new success story based on uh, service activities like, yes, call centers and mm, at the higher end uh, software and so on. Yeah? So all of this uh, the thinking conspired uh, to uh, partly in de uh, the, uh, deliberately, but the, the, the usually not the deliberately, the to create this thinking that yes, I mean, the who cares about the production? Yeah, yeah maybe the, they can do all this stuff in China, and you know, we only need to worry about you know, how to provide healthcare and so on. Yeah? But I think uh, there are lots of problems with these arguments. Huh? Well, first of all, regarding the neoliberal view, I mean, there's ample historical evidence showing that not only is industrialization necessary for economic development, but it does not happen automatically through market forces. And I have uh, shown many historical examples that uh, corroborating uh, that position in books like Kicking the Ladder and Bad Samaritans. Yeah, actually I want to draw the attention to the fact that this at least uh, so far remains the only book uh, endorsed both by Martin Ulf and Noam Chomsky. So, <laughs> you know, there's got to be something in there. Now, when you give them these uh, historical examples, the neoliberal economists are very puzzled because uh, they say, how can you know, these uh, the countries have done economically well when they use the, all the wrong policies like protectionism and subsidies and regulation of foreign investment? So many of them try to argue whichever country that has succeeded using these policies have succeeded despite rather than because of these policies. 
the most uh, frequently discussed example is the United States of America. Yeah? Now, I mean, it, it actually copied a lot of things uh, from Britain, that, uh, which actually that, uh, was very protectionist earlier on. But you know, the U.S. is the country that really you know, took uh, this uh, protectionism uh, to a new height. You know, I mean, uh, between the 1830s and the end of the Second World War, it was the most protected country in the world. You know? And it developed uh, the various uh, theories uh, justifying protectionism and so on. But that uh, a lot of economists say, oh, you know, but uh, the, don't think that the U.S. Uh, developed because of protectionism, but it developed despite protectionism because it had a lot of uh, countervailing conditions. You know? It had huge domestic market, so the negative imp impact of uh, the protectionism, one of which is that uh, you have uh, no competition, was uh, reduced because you had a lot of uh, market to fight for among domestic companies. It had a lot of natural resources, it had a lot of high quality immigrants from abroad and so on. Yeah, some people have uh, used this, uh, uh, the, this argument to criticize my work, but then I asked uh, back to them, okay, if uh, you may be right about the United States, but then how do you explain the fact that tiny Finland with uh, 3 million people used very high, maybe not as high as in the US, uh, very high protectionism until the 1960s and 70s and economically succeeded? You know? I mean, if uh, the, having so much natural resource was so good, how about uh, Japan and South Korea, which has no natural resource to talk about? Yeah? If uh, immigration was such a good thing, then how do you explain the fact that uh, countries like Germany and Taiwan were bleeding people actually into the United States yeah? and still did well? You know? So these uh, special case arguments uh, do not really work. I mean, it may work uh, uh, when there's only one country that uh, used these policies. Uh, to promote uh, industrialization, but uh, when you have 20 countries, 30 countries uh, who did that, I mean, this kind of argument doesn't really work. Anyway, I would argue that this, uh, you know, the neoliberal puzzle is a false one because actually there are many very good theoretical reasons why all those wrong policies have worked so well. I mean, I don't want to repeat this, but uh, you know, I mean, uh, for. Uh, economists uh, in the group, I mean, I would uh, even point out that even yeah, a version of the Austrian theory, which is uh, f famously the pro free market theory, can be reformulated to justify industrial policy. So, you know, it's only because that uh, they do not know these uh, theories or uh, want to disbelieve these theories, they think uh, it's uh, quite curious that the United States or Japan or the Germany or whichever country could have you know, used all those wrong policies and uh, still economically succeeded. You know? Well, as for the humanists, their problem is uh, not so much that they are not interested in raising productive capabilities. You know, they certainly do, that, uh, mainly by you know, making individuals more capable through investment in health, education, and skills. But the problem is that they are neglecting a very important uh, dimension of, if you like, collective productive capabilities. Huh? You know, you may produce thousands of uh, PhDs in engineering and science and business studies, but they have to be collected in productive enterprises you know, and work together to create economic development. You know? Because in modern economies, developments in productive capabilities mainly occur inside productive enterprises rather than at the individual level. You know? So to put it graphically, you know, 1,000 street food stores or 1,000 one-man TV repair shops are not going to enhance national productive capabilities even half as much as can one modern supermarket or one electronics manufacturer, each employing 600 workers and getting supplies by, uh, from 20 smaller enterprises that employ 20 people 
is on average, even if all the thousand owners of food stalls have PhD in food technology, eh? even if all the thousand guys are running this at the little TV repair shops have a PhD in electronics, eh? no. You know, in that sense, I uh, dare say that what really distinguishes uh, the United States and Germany from Nigeria and the Philippines of this world is their Boeings and Volkswagen. You know, it's not their economists and medical doctors. You know? you know, Philippines and Nigeria actually produce a lot of very capable economists and medical doctors, you know, except that they are all driving taxis in the New York. Yeah? In addition to business enterprises, uh, which are at the core of uh, the economic development, we also need to enhance a society's uh, productive capabilities through a series of uh, collective ins institutions that encourage and help different actors work together. So institutions that ensure capital labor collaboration within firms. You know, institutions that encourage uh, cooperation among firms within and across sectors, interaction between uh, institutions that, uh, that encourage uh, productive interaction between government and business, including but not just industrial policy, and finally, industry academia partnership. Yeah? So there are all these uh, collective dimensions of uh, productive capabilities. And unfortunately, the humanists have uh, ignored it, uh, ignored them. Yeah? I'm not saying that, that, that the humanist uh, framework is uh, inherently incapable of incorporating these dimensions. I mean, there are examples where this has been done, like uh, this report that, uh, uh, from Oxfam uh, a few years ago that called uh, From <coughs> Poverty to Power. But Unfortunately, uh, you know, many humanists have uh, really neglected this uh, collective dimension. So uh, we think that as far as uh, you educate people more and give them more health care, somehow they'll you know, get a microcredit and uh, create a prosperous economy. No, you need business enterprises. You need institutions that encourage uh, cooperation between you know, different enterprises, cooperation between government and enterprises and so on. Yeah? And finally, the, the, this uh, post-industrial economy discourse. Well, the, I, the, I mean, I have a lot of uh, the, the theoretical things to say about this, but the, the, I don't have time. So let me just uh, be brief uh, in introducing the main points. You know, the, the one common misperception is that uh, we experience uh, so-called deindustrialization, namely the share of uh, people working in manufacturing and the share of output produced by the manufacturing sector falling because we do not consume you know, the manufactured products uh, as much as before. But actually, not all of it, but most of it is exactly because uh, happening, exactly because manufacturing is uh, the, the more productive than services. Mm -hmm. Just think about it. I mean, uh, you know, uh, 20 years ago, I mean, if you wanted to buy, well, what would uh, count as a crappy computer today, I mean, you would have uh, spent uh, 1,500 pounds, yeah? You know, that uh, you can buy the, the same computing power with 100 pounds today. Hmm? So in a way, you are buying 15 computers with yeah. uh, that, uh, that uh, 1,500 pounds uh, you would have uh, spent uh, 20 years ago, whereas uh, your haircut is uh, still the same, you know, 30 pounds maybe, you know, uh, a bit more, you know, 40 pounds. So th if you add output according to current prices, it looks like the haircut uh, the sector has uh, grown enormously and uh, your computer industry has collapsed, you know. But the reality is that if you recalculate them in the prices uh, that prevailed 20 years ago, you will see that actually it is the computer sector that has grown. Yeah? So actually, the, if you recalculate the uh, outputs uh, in past prices, uh, what the economists call constant prices, most uh, rich countries, unfortunately, except the United Kingdom, have seen their manufacturing sector actually growing. Yeah? 
So for example, if you uh, recalculate the Swedish uh, the national output in this way, you know, in current prices, uh, the, in the last 20 years, the uh, Swedish manufacturing sector has uh, shrunken. Yeah? But in constant prices, actually it has grown by 50%, yeah? because it has become so much more productive. Yeah? So this uh, the common the misperception that should be the, dealt with. Also, you know, a lot of recent productivity growth in services have been illusory. I mean, we know about the financial sector, you know, I mean, all these dubious uh, the, the valuations and credit rating and basically, you know, I mean, even that, that uh, Lord Adair Turner, the former chairman of the uh, Financial Supervisory Authority, declared that most of the financial uh, the activities in the recent period have been yeah, destructive rather than creative of value. Yeah. But uh, even in areas like retail service, yeah? you know, I mean, all these uh, retail companies uh, keep you know, publishing uh, results uh, showing that their productivity have been rising, but a lot of this has uh, risen thanks to, if you like, the debasement of the product. Yeah? Because, you know, you now have to, you know, uh, when you go to the shoe store, I mean, instead of being greeted uh, immediately by a sales assistant, you now have to take a ticket, wait for 25 minutes. Yeah? You know, in order to go to the supermarket, now you have to drive much longer, you know, walk around uh, a lot longer because uh, the floor space is large. You know? In order to get uh, things delivered, uh, you have to wait a long time. You know? <coughs> So you order a sofa and the company calls you and say we'll deliver it on the 13th of March between 8 and 6. Yeah? So you ask, uh, okay, so do you want me to take out a day from my work? And they say yes. Yeah? You know, the, so you might get the sofa or the apple or whatever you're buying uh, cheaper, but the service, the quality of the retail service itself actually has uh, fallen. Yeah? So a lot of uh, this uh, the productivity growth uh, has uh, really been illusory. Yeah? Also, most uh, high-value services, you know, finance, engineering, IT services, consulting, and so on, mainly sell to the manufacturing sector, so they can uh, prosper without a strong manufacturing base. Yeah? Yeah, they can for a while, you know, for example, in Cambridge, there's this uh, famous uh, semiconductor company called Arm. Yeah? I have a friend who works there. He tells me that, yeah, I mean, the Arm uh, doesn't manufacture any you know, microchip in Britain. And everything is made in East Asia, Malaysia, South Korea, China. So this guy has to go there all the time. Yeah? And he is uh, convinced that in 10, 15 years' time, the company will have to move there. Yeah? Because as that, 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 I mean, that this uh, that technological coordination between the production department and the designers become more and more important, that uh, you actually have to be there together yeah, to bounce off ideas, uh, that, that, uh, bounce ideas off each other and you know, that, that coordinate this uh, very delicate process and so on. Yeah? So actually, you know, it is uh, not even clear that uh, Britain could survive by specializing in these uh, the services. Yeah. But then whenever I uh, give uh, the, these uh, arguments, people say, yeah, but what about uh, Switzerland and Singapore? Yeah. They keep uh, saying that. So in order to uh, talk about that, uh, let me show the, some more pictures. This is a famous uh, movie, The Third Man, uh, which was made in, I think, 1949, yeah? that, uh, directed uh, by the British director Carol Reed. And the sc story is about black marketing in the marketing in the penicillin in post Second World War Vienna. Apparently, the script was uh, the, written by Graham Greene, the British novelist, who later actually turned the script uh, into a novel, but there is uh, one passage uh, in the movie script, which apparently was uh, written by 
the leading actor, uh, Orson Welles, uh, the legendary American actor who you know, played uh, Citizen Kane. Yeah? Now, in the movie, the Welles appears as this uh, evil guy called Harry Lyme. Yeah? And the dialogue uh, he wrote himself, uh, apparently, is uh, in this scene where he is actually exposed as a, as a that, that basically drug kingpin and uh, confronted by his uh, friend uh, Joseph Cotton, uh, the British actor. And in this scene, Wells can, kind of launches into a diatribe, basically praising evil. Yeah? So his uh, point is that when has being good done anything good for us? Yeah? So in order to make that point, uh, he says this. He says, in Italy, for 30 years under the Borgias, we had everything bad about human nature, murder, poisoning, warfare, but they gave us the Renaissance. Yeah? In Switzerland, they lived in brotherly love, democracy, and peace for 500 years. And what, uh, <coughs> what did they produce? The Cuckoo Club. Yeah? You know, actually, this uh, passage, well, actually, the, not, uh, the, the last, uh, second half of this passage about Switzerland, the two sentences, they are remarkable in that in such a short uh, length, they contain five falsehoods. Yeah? <laughs> Some of you might uh, listen to this uh, BBC Radio 4 program, uh, The Unbelievable Truth, uh, uh, chaired by the, the David Mitchell, where people have to say outrageous things and uh, smuggle in the truth. Yeah? So it's uh, the opposite of unbelievable truth. Yeah? It's the uh, unbelievable, the, the untruth, yeah? or believable untruth. Yeah? So it uh, packs in five untruths uh, in this uh, short uh, uh, passage. Well, 500 years of democracy, you know, I don't know about other people, but I don't call a country a democracy if uh, half the people cannot vote. Yeah? Switzerland didn't give women vote until 1971. Well, actually, if you uh, count two rogue uh, cantons who refused to give women votes in local elections, uh, we are talking about 1991, you know. I mean, South Korea became democracy in 1987. Yeah? 500 years of peace, well, not quite true. They had a few wars uh, with neighbors. 500 years of brotherly love, no way. You know? I mean, they had uh, four civil wars within 200 years, yeah? I mean, not exactly yeah, that uh, peaceful. <laughs> the cuckoo clock was uh, not invented in Switzerland, it was invented in Germany. <laughs> and finally, you know, the view behind that, uh, what Othonel says uh, that uh, is, you know, I mean, Switzerland is uh, this, well, if you feel kind of nasty towards it, that uh, it's a country that Lives that uh, <coughs> by, you know, <coughs> excuse me, uh, can I have some water? Yeah, basically, it's an economy that lives off uh, the, the black money deposited by third world dictators in its banks and selling things like uh, cuckoo clocks and cowbells uh, to unsuspecting American and Japanese tourists. Uh, if you feel nice about it, you will say this is uh, the model of post-industrial economy, uh, thriving on services like banking and tourism. Yeah? Actually, it is uh, one of the most uh, industrialized countries in the world. Yeah? As uh, you can see from the figures. Yeah? In per capita terms, Switzerland actually produces the third largest amount of manufacturing value added in the world. Yeah? And it, it was actually number one until like uh, 2002, 2003. Uh, it has been overtaken by Singapore and Japan. Yeah, Singapore, uh, another uh, example of service economy. Uh. Yeah, of course, uh, you don't see made in Switzerland products uh, the, that much uh, because, well, A is uh, small, you know, it's only the, the 8 million people. But more importantly, it's uh, because it uh, specializes in what the economy is called producer goods. Yeah? So machines, industrial chemicals, yeah? measuring equipment, and things like that. 
So actually, in terms of uh, consumer product uh, that we encounter in supermarkets, they only make cereals. You know? I mean, uh, not even those that are uh, very much. Yeah? And uh, of course, uh, they make uh, pharmaceutical products, but that's about it. You know? So it's not like, I mean, they are making t-shirts or whatever uh, that we normally buy. They no, uh, make things that we do not normally buy. Yeah? They make things that uh, other companies buy to make other things. Yeah? Anyway, but, you know, I mean, this is uh, quite remarkable. You know, that, uh, you might have thought uh, everything is uh, made in China. Yes, I mean, that uh, it's uh, huge and therefore, you know, in absolute terms, uh, the, well, it almost looks like everything is made in China, but Actually, in per capita terms, the Chinese that uh, produce only one ninth uh, that of uh, Switzerland in manufacturing output. Yeah? So, what are we talking about? Yeah? How is this a mod model of uh, service-based economy? Yeah? Same story as Singapore. I mean, at the moment, it's the largest manufacturing economy in the world. I mean, in relative terms. Yeah? At least India, isn't it doing quite well based on, you know, call centers and you know, <laughs> software and, yeah, I'm sure that many of you have yeah, called some software company and uh, talked to an Indian engineer sitting in Mumbai or the, got, you know, unsolicited uh, calls about, you know, that uh, your mortgage uh, from, you know, some guy calling from, you know, the India pretending to be calling from Bradford, you know. Yes, uh, India has uh, the, made uh, significant progress in the service sector, but it hasn't been such a success. Huh? Well, until 2004, India actually had deficit in service trade. Yeah? So it imported more service than that, uh, it exported. Between 2004 and 2009, it did record service trade surplus, but it covered only less than 20% of its, oh, the, uh, this is a the mistake, uh, it's a merchandise trade deficit. Yeah? So that's a manufacturing import plus you know, food and oil and so on. Yeah, yeah so actually it, uh, it uh, had a huge trade deficit overall. Yeah? I mean, this uh, service uh, sector had, yeah, I mean, not in considerable that, that, uh, surplus, but that was uh, far too inadequate to cover its uh, deficits in other areas, including manufacturing. Yeah? So, Indian success stories are highly exaggerated, and you know, except for Britain in the heydays of uh, the, the financial bubble, no country has uh, really covered its uh, manufacturing deficit with uh, service export. Yeah? yeah, even the United States, you know, I mean, the, the, in the last uh, couple of decades, uh, it's uh, always uh, had kind of uh, trade deficit in manufacturing equivalent to 4% of GDP. Its uh, service trade surplus was uh, never more than 1.5% of GDP. You know? Okay, so having said all this, uh, let me conclude. Does it really matter, you know? What if uh, we neglect uh, production? Yeah? Well, I would say that it has uh, created a lot of negative uh, the consequences. Of course, uh, the, thanks to the sort of neoliberal the, the emphasis on you know, consumption being the yeah, uh, foundation of our utility and social welfare and so on, producing more has been greatly emphasized in the last uh, three decades. But actually, despite this, uh, there was very little uh, has been very little discussion on how to increase the ability to produce. Yeah? So somehow, I mean, the production was uh, supposed to grow, but uh, you never really talked about how to make it grow. Yeah? And this has uh, made a lot of people think that what the country produces to earn its income does not really matter. I mean, to borrow a famous yeah, 
expression from the 1980s uh, debate on industrial policy, it doesn't matter whether you produce potato chips or microchips. Yeah? All that counts is how much money you are earning. Yeah? But of course, uh, the, you know, uh, this has had actually very serious uh, negative effect, especially in developing countries. This has made many countries complacent about their dependence on commodities or cheap assembly. Actually, many developing countries have uh, gone backward in the last couple of decades in terms of, the, in terms of their production structure. You know, Brazil has become far more dependent on the primary commodities than it was at, uh, at, uh, 20 years ago and so on. Yeah? But in the long run, different economic activities give different scope for growth and technological development. So even from a purely growth-oriented point of view, this line of thinking is problematic. Yeah? The reason why South Korea got, uh, could have, uh, ha has been able to sustain yeah, uh, the continued uh, growth, uh, whereas uh, countries like you know, uh, Malaysia and Mexico and so on have uh, uh, kind of fizzled out is because you know, South Koreans kept investing in building new productive capabilities. Yeah. Secondly, the neglect of productive capabilities has also meant that our assessment of policies have acquired very unfortunately short-term biases. Yeah? Because policies that reduce current consumption with a view to increasing long-term productive capabilities have been too easily dismissed. You know, I mean this idea of uh, infant industry protection, you know, the fact that uh, the argument that you protect and nurture your young industries in the same way that uh, you protect and nurture your children until they grow up and can compete in the you know, world market, this has been too easily dismissed. Yeah? I mean, of course, it has, uh, that, like all other economic theories, that uh, has uh, that its own problems, but you know, that because uh, we really didn't care about you know, increasing productive capabilities, Many people say, oh yeah, but uh, if you protect, uh, consumers suffer. Yeah? But then we are trying to you know, use uh, that, that suffering uh, for you know, kind of, uh, that, uh, something that will uh, bring us a uh, longer term benefit. Well, that dimension yeah, is uh, not always uh, that, uh, kind of ascertained, but you, know, you at least need to have a debate. But uh, there hasn't even been a debate. Yeah? In particular, the collective dimensions of productive development has been neglected, making people ignore the issue of how to develop modern firms and other institutions that are central to productive development. Of course, I mean, especially if you go to the World Bank, there's a lot of talk of private sector development, but it is a negative agenda in the sense that deregulation and cutting taxes are seen as the key to enterprise development. We actually need a lot more than that. Yeah? You know, if our low tax was so good, why aren't all companies moving to Albania where corporate tax rate is only 10%? Yeah? <laughs> you know, if uh, the deregulation was uh, so good, why aren't all companies moving to Somalia where there's no regulation whatsoever? Yeah? <laughs> so, Actually, if you look at the successful economies, uh, you see, you know, I mean, that the, everyone in the society, that, uh, from workers that, that to managers to entrepreneurs to government to universities, working together to develop uh, these uh, productive enterprises and develop private sector. You know? Yeah, I'm sure there are countries where they could do with some yeah, deregulation in some areas and yeah, some costs in certain taxes and so on. But you know, I mean, it's a very that, that, uh, kind of uh, problematic uh, that thinking that, oh yeah, as far as you just let everyone do whatever they want to, yeah, the economy will develop. Well, then you get the car pullers and the, the tire slashers of uh, the Indonesia and South Africa. And finally, the neglect of production has also led to a very partial view of our individual well-being. Because we are mainly conceptualized as consumers rather than producers, so issues of 
employment, the quality of jobs and workplace welfare have been completely ignored. Yeah? Yeah, so why are you complaining? Because uh, the, the statistics are show that uh, your wage is rising. Well, the, I may be complaining because uh, my commute is at, uh, much more at, uh, horrible because of lack of investment in infrastructure, my work is more stressful, and so on. Yeah? But uh, these dimensions have uh, all been ignored. Yeah? Well, to conclude, in this speech, I have uh, tried to show how the last three decades <coughs> has uh, seen the neglect of production in the development discourse and how the neglect has created a lot of negative consequences. So I argue that we need to reconstruct our development discourse by bringing production back in. This is not to suggest that we go back to the old days of aggregate approach focused on you know, macro uh, level resource mobilization and labor absorption. This uh, reconstruction has to be done by combining those old insights with the more recent theoretical developments on technological learning, innovation, and enterprise development. It also has to take individuals uh, more seriously, not just as consumers, hmm? nor just as uh, citizens with entitlements, as in the humanist approach, but also as producers hmm? who have to worry about employment and the content of their work. Hmm? Well, in this uh, speech, I could only sketch out uh, some of the very basic ideas as to how this uh, recon reconstruction may, may be achieved, but I uh, hope I have uh, stimulated uh, your interest enough so that at least some people can uh, join in this uh, endeavor of uh, rebuilding the development discourse uh, with uh, more emphasis on the production and productive capabilities. Thank you. All oh, right, yeah. Oh, uh, the, yeah, the, this is uh, the commercial break. Uh, the, uh, this is a new book uh, coming out uh, on the, the 1st of May. Uh, this is uh, meant to introduce economics to, well, everyone with uh, more than a secondary education. It's uh, the, published in the Revive uh, Pelican paperback series uh, from Penguin Press, uh, so you might want to check it out. Yeah, and as I promised, uh, that these are my website address. Uh, if you go to my personal website, you can download some of the papers that I mentioned today and also see other things. Uh, so there you go. Good. Thank you very, very much, uh, Adrian. Thank you. I'm not really clapping the fact that you're giving a personal and uh, commercial speech. No, no, no. It's because uh, your commercial cut across the clapping that you deserve. <laughs> Thanks very much. I have to say, I'm a manufacturing engineer, by trade, so I'm, I like a lot of what you say. And the floor is open for uh, questions to uh, Yes, please. Um, do you want to say who you are? Yes, I'm uh, Walid. <coughs> Sorry? Walid. Walid. Oh, yes. Yeah. And, uh, oh, wait till the, wait till the, the yeah, microphone. Yeah, Here it is. Here it is. Well, and what do you do about it? I'm doing my PhD in Peace and Security Studies for right. the Middle East. Thank you. Um, professor, you mentioned the protectionism in the United States and you compared it with Sweden. Uh, are you suggesting to kind of alternative for what we have as a crisis today for the economy to replace an old model with a new phenomenon of protectionism today? Right. Thank uh. you. Shall I collect a few questions and uh, okay. yeah, deal with them? Uh, okay, go ahead. Yeah. John Baruch, uh, I'm a member of Stamp here. Uh, we work a lot with Mozumba University in Tanzania, and they are very interested in the sort of economic model that they should be developing. How should we be talking to them? And certainly, my interest in the technological area is what should we be saying to them? Mm. Okay, so third one, and then we'll uh, ask Hadrian to answer. Yes, please. Hi, uh, Zico from uh, the management school, I'm a PhD student there. I wish to ask, 
how do you, uh, what is your opinion about the new institutional economics view about institutions, basically formal and informal institutions that underlie productive capabilities? And, yeah. Uh, if you could you know, talk a bit more yeah. about how you see the link. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. All very big topics. I cannot yeah really do justice uh, to them uh, in my short answer. Uh, well, first of all, protection is a you know like any tool. It can be good. It can be bad. I mean, it all depends on how you use it for what purpose. You know, with the same knife, uh, someone might yeah you know, cook a wonderful meal. Another person might kill another person. Yeah. So that. The devil's in the details, really. So, I mean, if uh, someone asks uh, whether protectionism can be a general solution to you know, today's uh, economic problem, then you know, I uh, refuse to answer. Yeah? But you know, the, for particular sectors in particular countries, or especially for you know, kind of, uh, poor economies, yes, uh, the, they will need uh, more protection than the, they have today. Yeah? Uh, you know. Basically, that, that without some degree of protection in the beginning, countries cannot develop. Yeah? I mean, it's as uh, simple as that. Yeah? It's the same principle as uh, most people agreeing that children need to go to school at least up to a certain age uh, to become a productive member of the society. Yeah? So I'm not uh, saying anything radical. You know, I mean, that this idea is uh, known as infant industry protection. Yeah? It may sound very radical today, but uh, the idea was invented by the first U.S. Treasury Secretary, Alexander Hamilton. That's the guy you see on the $10 bill. Yeah? It was a standard policy. Yeah, yeah because uh, that, you know, I mean, in the same way that, that, that child labor that actually arrests that, that children's development and make them less productive in the long run, having too much uh, the competition in the beginning doesn't give this that, 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 that producers in developing countries the ability to build uh, productive capabilities. Yeah, yeah and uh, that uh, links uh, to this uh, question of what should uh, countries like Uganda do. Well, I think uh, that... Tanzania. Ah, uh, oh, was it? Yeah, Tanzania, yeah. But I think we'll... <laughs> yeah, neighbors, possibly but yeah. Similar, possibly similar. Yeah, well, I mean, that, you know, that poor countries uh, that look quite similar, not because yeah, uh, the, of things like culture and so on, but uh, because uh, their economic structure is actually very similar. Yeah? So the, what do you tell countries like Tanzania and Uganda? Well, I think uh, the most important thing is uh, that there has to be a recognition that uh, they need to, in the long run, increase their ability to produce and eventually to innovate. Yeah? And this is how countries like uh, South Korea succeeded. Yeah? You know, in the 1950s, it was one of the poorest countries. Its uh, main exports were whatever little natural resource uh, that it had, yeah? tungsten ore, yeah? fish, seaweed. Yeah? And what little manufacturing existed uh, consisted of things like making wigs out of human hair. Yeah? You know, apparently the, the in those days you had to plant every strand of hair onto whatever you put on your head uh, uh, when you're wearing a wig and it was very labor intensive so it uh, could make money only in countries with dirt cheap labor like South Korea. Yeah? Yeah, so that, that you may have to start with uh, things like that, but uh, eventually you have to aim to do bigger things. Yeah, yeah so that, you know, I mean, uh, exactly how you do it uh, will have to be different, but yes, I mean, there has to be continuous emphasis on skills, yeah, and that uh, organizing enterprises, yeah, and teaching them you know, production techniques, management techniques. You know, this is where real economic development is made. Eh? It's not made in some, you know, the, the IMF economists that are showing yeah, some kind of uh, equations and yeah, telling them how, how much budget to cut. Yeah? You know, it doesn't happen in that way. Yeah? So that I, in, I think uh, in that sense that, that, you know, the fact that scientists and engineers are actually working with these countries to uh, the help them uh, develop their economies is uh, very heartening because that, uh, you know, we, we have uh, come to neglect uh, production so much uh, that uh, people 
Just don't have this I, uh, the idea that uh, someone has to actually produce things yeah, to uh, develop the economy. Yeah? Uh, finally, well, on the role of institutions, yeah, I'll have to ask you to look at some of my papers in my website. I mean, it's uh, such a big topic. But yes, I mean, the institutions are obviously the very important uh, because uh, that they basically the define what are acceptable, what are encouraged, uh, what are discouraged and so on. So if you have uh, the institutions encouraging uh, the behavior that is uh, uh, negative for the whole society, even though they may, uh, they may benefit uh, uh, some people, then of course that, uh, you will have a collectively negative result. Yeah? So institutional development is very important, but the one thing you have to remember is that uh, this development takes time. Yeah? If you look at the history of uh, today's rich countries, in the 18th and 19th century, it took them decades, even centuries, to develop you know, institutions. They had to have 300 years of continuous financial crisis before they realized that having a central bank might be a good idea. Yeah? So the developing countries actually can uh, leapfrog that, yeah? because that, uh, we, we know that there are certain institutions that are likely to produce good results. Of course, uh, there's no guarantee. It has to uh, be compatible with your own informal institutions. So the, there comes in the distinction between formal and informal. You can write all the laws you want, but uh, if uh, they don't gel with your underlying institutions, informal institutions, uh, they would not work. But yes, I mean, that, uh, still that uh, you can learn uh, from you know, countries that have already traveled the path and uh, reduce your learning cost, if you like. Yeah? Okay, we'll take um, three more, and then we'll uh, go to the closest. I mean, opportunity for one two, and three. And the opportunity for informal discussion uh, and the reception. So, one here. Can we start here, please? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Turn the other way. There's a microphone coming. Go ahead. Uh, uh, yes. Um, Can you say who you are? Oh, I'm uh, Marie McKay, an undergraduate of development and peace studies. Thank you. Right. Very um, Yes, I've, I've been interested in Mariana Mazzucato's work about um, um, fact techn technological innovation, mm. and that most of it is, in fact, is unlike what the neoliberals say, is, is the paid for by uh, the public sector into right. everything that's in the iPhone. Yeah. So how can uh, developing countries, I mean, most of that's been paid by DEFRA, which have a, a massive budget, and the military, obviously, so how can developing countries possibly match that kind of uh, spending? Mm. Mm. Okay, thank you. There's yeah. another question here. You've already got a microphone. I don't know. Oh, it's coming. Thank you, sorry to um, stop you. It's fine. Um, Thomas, I'm doing a master's in uh, development and project planning. Um, it was related to uh, innovation as well. You mentioned that obviously if, um, if a country wants to develop, uh, to be developed, um, it has to produce some goods itself, so it has to be innovative. And then obviously the innovation has to come from somewhere, so it probably has to have a, a country has to have a strong education sector. Um, and in order for it to have a strong education sector, um, the money to educate people has to come from somewhere. And then the um, lady mentioned the military budget that a lot of countries spend uh, money on the military, um, probably rather than investing in education. Um, and obviously for those countries, it's harder to develop the education sector. So um, yeah, just a thought. <laughs> yeah. 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 Hello, my name is Sopo, uh, in BCID student development study. Uh, my question is the I read uh, uh, your book is 23, is 23 mm -hmm. things that uh, you don't tell. Uh, they don't yeah, tell they don't tell you about characters. Very wrong. wrong. Um, I'm very interesting about. Uh, about corruption, you uh, compared to Bangladesh and Congo case. Yeah. So um, mm -hmm. is the dictatorship era? They put their money on their bank. Uh, Congo is the dictator. He put the money from Switzerland bank, but uh, Bangladesh case, they put the money to on their country. So Bangladesh is the economic growth after them. But Congo case is the mm -hmm. 
uh, not economic growth uh, so much. So I'm. This is related to our uh, my my class lecture uh, mm -hmm. from Dr. Yeah. Kibi Anand. So yeah. the reason why I want to ask you about the. Um, I'm quite shocked. Yeah. 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 I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm quite shocked. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank I'm you. I'm quite shocked that uh, the, uh, this is not common sense. Always the yeah. my common sense is that this uh, the corruption is distract the economic growth, uh -huh. but this case is different. So I want to. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's a good question. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. On the first and the second question of uh, innovation education. And I would emphasize uh, skills uh, training because a lot of school education is actually you know, useless uh, for you know, uh, work. You know, I'm not against it. You know, I mean, you need to you know, educate people in a lot of things uh, to make them you know, uh, the civilized persons and good citizens and so on. But you know, from purely economic point of view. You know, teaching things like history and music and language is a waste of time, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of uh, the, the training actually has to be done in the enterprises or in specialized uh, training institutes uh, like in Germany. Yeah? Anyway, um, yeah, these are all related now. Yeah, that uh, for those who haven't seen it, yeah, the, my friend Mariana Matsukato the, wrote this uh, the book called The Entrepreneur State, uh, basically showing how many of the past breaking innovations have been actually funded uh, by public sector. Now, the twist there is that a lot of these uh, were done in the United States, and a lot of these were done by basically the US military. You know, even down to semiconductors, which was uh, financed by the U.S. Navy. You know? So this is uh, one you know, the unexpected positive uh, result of the Cold War. You know? Now, however, having said that, you know, that not all countries uh, that uh, can do it, should do it uh, in the way the U.S. did. And frankly, that when you are at the low level of development, you know, innovation is something that you cannot really think about. You know, you know I mean, uh, Isaac Newton once uh, famously said that if I get, can see further than other people, it's because I stand on the shoulders of giants. Yeah? In the same way, I mean, developing countries really need to learn and absorb uh, the technologies already developed and routinely used in the rich countries. Yeah? I mean, this is what uh, Japan did in the beginning, Korea did in the beginning, you know. So the, the, this creative R&D is that, that, that <laughs> Uh, quite far away for these countries, but there always has to be this uh, recognition that all the time you have to invest in developing the ability of uh, your country at the individual level, at the organization level, at the institutional level, at the, 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 the government level, the ability to learn and uh, create uh, new knowledge. Yeah? And uh, this requires, yes, uh, formal education, absolutely, but also a lot of uh, the training, on-the-job training, you know, specialized uh, the, the skills training and so on. And I mean, these have to be actually coordinated with your overall industrial development strategy because uh, if uh, your government is, uh, I don't know, giving out subsidies to promote semiconductor industry and your universities are producing chemical engineers, uh, there's something wrong there. Eh? Yeah, no, I'm not uh, necessarily favoring one over another. Yeah? Uh, yeah, and whether the, you know, defense spending uh, the, is uh, incompatible with uh, these things, you know, I mean, one interesting fact is that uh, thanks to being the frontier states in the Cold War, countries like South Korea and Taiwan had to spend uh, something like 5 to 6% of GDP on defense compared to international average of 2.5%. Uh, so if you have the will uh, to do it, you know, uh, even defense uh, spending is uh, not an obstacle. Yeah? Because uh, let's face it, I mean, defense uh, spending is the most difficult to cut. Yeah? Uh, 
Yeah, as for corruption, well, uh, you know, basically the, my view is that uh, there is corruption and there is corruption. Yeah? So, no, I, I mean, ethically, you know, I don't condone any of it, but, uh, you know, in terms of its uh, consequences of economic growth and so on, I mean, the different types of corruption have different impacts. Yeah? So, whether the money stays inside the country matters, what sector that they influence matter, you know, I mean, South Korea, Japan, they were very corrupt, you know? Only that, that their corruption was uh, focused on the sectors that didn't really affect the export industry, like, you know, urban planning or defense, you know, I mean, uh, if uh, the government is uh, buying planes or military equipment, yes, I mean, there were huge kickbacks and everything, but uh, these corruptions are never influence sectors like you know, automobile or semiconductors and so on, so that they were able to contain the negative effect and so on. So, I mean, I cannot uh, uh, explain it all uh, here, but, uh, you know, uh, basically that uh, you have to closely look at exactly in what form, in what sectors the corruption is happening and what is happening to the money itself, you know, is it staying or leaving and so on. Yeah? Okay. okay. Good. Well, thank you very much, uh, Jim. Let's uh, stop shouting. <laughs> um, yes, thank you very much.